on to Haynes. Neil Haynes. Let's talk about Haynes here. Haynes was born in 1753, so you can tell we're going back pretty far. Um, he was an illegitimate so-called offspring of a black man and a white woman, so his mother abandoned him. So he was uh, brought in by by a, what he says is a godly family, David Rose. And the Rose family, the guy was a deacon, was touched by the First Great Awakening, America's First Great Revival. And apparently, according to Haynes, uh, treated him like one of their children. So it was sort of an adoption of sorts. And um, he he became interested in religion because of because of his sort of adopted father's example. And in fact, in 1774, enlisted with the Minutemen and Haynes. So remember, he's he's mixed uh, here. He was able to serve with George Washington's forces at the siege of Boston in 1775, and was part of the garrison at Fort Ticonder in New York in 1776. Pretty amazing. But he did not only do that, he still criticized America because he's risking his life for America. And yet, what's America doing for black folks? So in 1801, listen to what he said. He spoke of the poor Africans, quote, what has reduced them that, that poor Africans was also a quote from, from from Haynes, not myself. What has reduced them to their present pitiful abject state? Is it any distinction of the God of nature? hath made in their formation? Nay, but being subjected to slavery by the cruel hands of oppressors, they've been taught to view themselves as a rank of beings far below others, which has suppressed in a degree every principle of manhood, and so they became despised, ignorant, and licentious. This shows the effects of despot despotism and should fill us with the utmost detestation against every attack on the rights of men. That's good. And he did that at the celebration of the 25th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence to point out the hypocrisy in America. And in fact, he wrote an unpublished manuscript called Liberty Further Extended. Let me read some of that from Haynes here. We live in a day wherein liberty and freedom is the subject of many millions concern, and the important struggle hath already caused great effusion of blood. Men seem to manifest the most sanguine resolution not to let their natural rights go without their lives go with them. A resolution will but think everyone that has the least love to his country or future posterity would fully confide in. Yet, while we are so zealous to maintain and foster our own individual rights, it cannot be thought impertinent for us candidly to reflect on our own conduct, and I doubt not but that we shall find subsisting in the midst of us what may with propriety be styled oppression, nay, much greater oppression than that which Englishmen seem so much to spurn at, I mean an oppression which they themselves impose upon others. He's saying, because he, he's quite verbose with his vocabulary, he's saying that we're complaining about rights and freedom here. You know, this is during the patriotic time of America. And yet, uh, we're, we're having slaves in our own midst. And uh, here's one more quote on that. A Negro may justly challenge and has an undeniable right to his liberty. Consequently, the practice of slave keeping, which so much abounds in this land, is illicit. So again, I'm doing this to show a number of things. One is to show how black Christians, by and large, are the leaders of civil rights movements from the beginning all the way up uh, to the modern era, okay? And I'm showing how Christianity did not have a pacifying effect. It's not to say no one ever misused it. Obviously, they did. But it was showing that these folks got ideas from the Bible that they enacted and implemented. It was the opposite of what the common trope is today. And in fact, Haynes drew directly um, from Acts 17.26 in his argumentation about this and he said this God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed in the bounds of their habitation all are of one species and so then he said they enjoy should enjoy the same rights liberty is equally as precious to a black man as it is to a white man and bondage equally intolerable to the one as it is to the other God has been pleased to distinguish some men from others as to natural abilities but not as to natural right for as they came out of his hands that's good right there that's good and he called slavery a hell upon earth and all this for filthy lucre's sake and uh this is uh it's just really good what he says here let me read let me read one more thing what he wrote about the slave trade oh what an immense deal of african blood hath been shed by the inhumane cruelty of the englishmen that reside in a christian land oh ye that have made yourselves drunk with human blood although you may go with impunity here in the life yet god will hear the cries of that innocent blood which cries from the sea and from the ground against you like the blood of abel <laughs> that's good so 
um, he was an indentured servant until age 21. I'm kind of going back here now. And uh, there was a certain place, time where him and his family, uh, this is before he went to the ministry, I'm going back, I'm backtracking, um, would read sermons by Whitfield or, or, or Watts or somebody. And one time he slipped in one of his new sermons he had written, and the family was a- absolutely impressed because usually they would read other people's sermons. So he began doing pulpit supply for local pastors. And one pastor even taught him Greek. And then Haynes became proficient in Greek of the New Testament as well as the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So by 27, um, he, he he was he was publicized for five, about five months there, got married um, to someone that was converted under his ministry. And then she proposed to him. She was a school teacher. He was ordained in 1785, and he pastored a couple years in Connecticut. But one guy was really upset that he was going to have a black pastor. So this guy refused to attend church. And finally, the guy went to church after Haynes had been there a while. But he said, I'm going to refuse to take my hat off. And he sat in the back. So the whole time, he's got his hat on. But then when Haynes started preaching, the guy was so impressed, he he took off his hat quietly and put it under a seat and then began paying attention. <laughs> uh, so in 1788, his family went to Vermont, and he took charge of the congregational church there, which was mainly a white Church and they had two revivals 103 joined one year and 109 another, which is pretty amazing. And um, imagine this at this time having a black pastor over mainly a white church that's pretty impressive. A lot of white people won't even do that now. Ooh, did I go there? Yes, I did. And uh, I like how he was involved with apologetic issues. He attacked a guy named Jose Balu, who was the leader of universalism, and he and he talked about universal salvation. And you can actually read. Uh, Haynes' critique of it called Universal Salvation, a very ancient doctrine, which is pretty scathing. And it went through 70 editions between 1805 and 1860. So that's pretty good. And, of course, the Universalists would not only assail his ideas, but with racist jibes, saying things like, Haynes' mind is as black as his skin and things like that. But he was pretty witty himself, and there's a couple – uh, quotes where he deals with people and in fact I like this one right here uh, when Andrew Jackson who was pretty much a horrible man I'm glad he's getting replaced by Tubman on the 20 uh, became president um, Haynes was no fan of Jackson and so they they asked Haynes uh, uh, hey let's do a toast to the new president so Haynes got up and he just said Andrew Jackson Psalm 109 verse 8 and then he left and everyone was like, what? So everyone looked up Psalm 109, verse 8, and guess what it says? Let his days be few, and let another take his office. <laughs> that is killer. That is that is epic. That is really epic. But after about 30 years, this is what's sad. The people of Rutland started complaining about having a black pastor. Basically, the racism got worse, not better. It went and starts and starts. And that's something people need to understand. This is going to take us off a little bit, but there's still folks who were worried America could go like this again. Because a lot of us, uh, I see people who think, oh, that can never happen. But if you study American history, things like this happened. For example, after Reconstruction and going to Jim Crow, when you study history, you can see. Now, I don't, by God's grace, I don't think that's going to happen. But you got to understand the fear. And, and I think if we study history, we'll understand the fear about the future better. Anyways, this man had preached over 5,000 sermons. 400 of them were funerals. And this town had enjoyed two large revivals during his pastorship. And yet, he says it's as if they woke up one day and realized they had a black pastor. So he was gone. So he went to another church briefly, and he did some other ministry work. And some of it's quite interesting. Um, he ministered to prisoners, a number of other things, did some stuff in New York, saw some success there. And uh, let me just read here this last thing here, which he said apparently on his deathbed. I have been examining myself and looking back upon my past life. I can find nothing in myself and nothing in all my past services to recommend me at the bar of Jehovah. Jesus Christ is my all. His blood is my only hope of acceptance. Amen. He died September 28th, 1833. And that is Emil Haynes. 